I know what many of you said this morning when you came into church. I do. Many of you said the common greeting. Hi. How are you doing? Hello. How are you? I probably just quoted half of you exactly. And I know what response you got, too. You probably got something to the effect of, I'm good. Or if you're a linguistically or grammatically correct person, I'm well. And then you follow that up with a polite response, because we're polite, right? And so you said, I'm good. How are you? You say, how did you know that I said that? <laughs> I did it too. Several years back when I was in Michigan, I was managing a medical equipment company and I went to a medical office and there was a woman there on uh, a staff member at this medical office and she greeted me with the same greeting that most of you did this morning. She said, hi, how are you? And I looked back at her and said, I'm good. How are you? To which she responded with a statement that I'll never forget. A smile came across her face. She paused for a moment and thought before she spoke. And she said these words. I'm blessed and highly favored. I thought she was weird. I thought, that was a very odd response, and I smiled and didn't know what to say. Walked away, went back to work. It's a common word that she used, though. It's another word that we use, perhaps even as filler, when we don't know what else to wish for a person. Blessed. I'm blessed. We'll say things like, have a blessed day. Or if something good happens in our lives, what a blessing. Or perhaps if we're signing off on an email or a letter or someone's leaving on a trip, we'll say, God bless you. And so many other forms of that phrase that we can come up with. But the question that I have for us this morning as we approach this text is, what does it mean to be blessed? Are we wishing someone good luck? That's what the world says, right? I hope you have good fortune. Good luck. Wish me luck. And so is blessing nothing more than wishing someone good happenstance that chance would be in their favor? No. To be blessed from the Bible's perspective means that you are blessed of God. And what does it mean to be blessed of God? Well, if we were to use a word that we know better, it would be the word favor. We know that word. Maybe we don't use it a lot, but we use it when we say the word favorite. Favorite. God shows his favor to us. Many of you have heard that the word blessed means to be happy. Certainly, Happiness is a byproduct of being blessed. But to be blessed means that God is looking on you with his favor. He sees you in a favorable light. And that's why in Luke chapter 1, Luke writes of Mary that she is blessed among women because she bore the Christ child. Now, blessing isn't always physical. Often, blessing can be spiritual. And in the New Testament, when we read about blessedness or blessings, we read of all kinds of spiritual blessings. In fact, if I were to ask you to tell me where in the New Testament you would go to find the word blessed, many or most of you would say, Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they. Well, in the Beatitudes, we find that individuals are blessed or are favored by God in some specific way. And that, in fact, they can feel blessed 
regardless of their earthly circumstances. Because their blessedness, their favor from God transcends this material world. You may have come in this morning not feeling blessed, but that doesn't mean you're not. And so today in John chapter 20, we'll be looking at verses 24 through 29, and we will find the reward that is blessing. Now, this is an iconic passage. It's a well-known passage because it's come to be memorialized, or at least the main subject of this passage has come to be memorialized as this one guy called Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. And today in these few verses, we'll find something that we shouldn't do, something that we should do, and a reward that comes from doing what we should. Here's what this passage is going to tell us we shouldn't do. Here's our don't. Don't disbelieve. Don't disbelieve. That's our don't. That's what we shouldn't do. And then we'll see in this passage, here's what we should do. Do believe. Don't disbelieve. Do believe. And the point of the passage this morning and the point of the songs that you just affirmed are this is this if you have believed without seeing then you are blessed and highly favored so keep believing even though you can't see the title of the sermon this morning is the father's favor of sightless faith would you look with me please at verse 24 of john chapter 20 Now, Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. As we begin to look at these these few verses, I want to give you the, the background and the context of what's going on here. Where was Thomas not when Jesus came? Well, last time we looked at the fifth appearance of Jesus after his resurrection. He rose from the dead, he appeared four times, and the fifth time was to his disciples. But it was only to ten of them. Ten of them, we find that out from this verse. So Judas Iscariot, he was long gone, and apparently Thomas was out of the room. And so Jesus had appeared to ten of his disciples after he rose from the dead, and thus they had believed that he rose from the dead. Now John is the only gospel that records this particular encounter today. And I believe it's because John's theme of his entire book is that of belief, believing. And so we're introduced to the subject of our book, of our passage, the main character of our passage, this guy named Thomas, or as we better know him, Doubting Thomas. Who was Thomas amongst his 12 disciples? Well, he was an ardent follower. In fact, Thomas was right up there with with Peter and his pizzazz in, in wanting to follow Christ. Back when Jesus' good friend Lazarus was was ill and almost on his deathbed, Jesus was nowhere near Lazarus because the Jews were trying to kill him. And so Jesus announced to his disciples, we have to go back to Bethany and see our friend Lazarus. And 11 of Jesus' disciples said, no way. Why would we walk back into harm's way? We can't go back to Bethany. They're trying to kill you. But Thomas, in John chapter 11 and verse 6, this is what he said in response to his colleagues. Let us also go, that we may die with him. That's Thomas. Kind of reminds you of Peter. I will go to the death for you. And so we see them in their strength of faith and in their moments of doubt. And so we will see Thomas in his moment of doubt today. And so Thomas missed the first appearance to the disciples of Jesus Christ, and because he wasn't there to see it, he wouldn't believe his friends. Verse 25. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, hmm, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger 
into the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will never believe. Whew. Thomas is dead set. No discussion. I will never. In fact, in Greek, there are two words there for that word never. In English, we have that one word, never. In, in Greek, there's two words, and it's a double negative. And the reason we don't translate it as a double negative into English is because a double negative means something different in Greek. If in English, we used a double negative in this sentence, we would say, I will never not believe. What does that mean? I will never not believe. That means I will always believe. A double negative turns into a positive, not so in Greek. In Greek, when you use a double negative, it puts even more emphasis on your negative. And so it would sound like this. I will never, never believe. And so we have Thomas demand. Thomas wanted to exercise two of his senses, sight and touch. Unless I see and unless I touch, I will never, never believe. And so Thomas felt that he could verify the truth claims with his own demand. Doesn't this sound familiar? I mean, come on, how many people have you all spoken with that are not believers in Jesus Christ that have said something to the effect of, if I saw him, maybe. I mean, if he appeared to me and I could see him and prove it, then I'd believe. I mean, we must have all heard something to that effect over our lives. Unless I see Jesus, I won't believe. I had a coworker in Bellingham, Washington, who I was discussing the Bible with. He was not a Christian and and he said, there's no empirical evidence for Jesus Christ. That's a really fancy way of saying exactly what Thomas just said. Empirical just means I can visualize it. I can, I can test it with my senses. I can observe it. There's no empirical evidence for Jesus Christ. Maybe if there were some empirical evidence for Jesus Christ, then I would believe. And, that, and that's how our, our educated society says exactly what, what Thomas said. And I told my coworker, I said, are you kidding me? The empirical evidence is all around us. How do you not see it? Look at the tree out that window. That's what I told him. How is that not empirical evidence for the creator God of the universe? Look at the mountains. Look at Mount Baker. Empirical evidence for the creator. I told, him, I told my coworker, you have trees, you have mountains, you have the Bible, you have fulfilled prophecy, signs and wonders. But then I said, you want more empirical evidence? Look at your sin. The Bible tells you everything about yourself. And it's right. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. The Bible's right. I said to him, look at marriage. You look at marriage. Where in the world did marriage come from? In, in every society, in, in the history of the world, marriage. Empirical evidence for the creator. And here's Thomas. He's not willing to look at one prophecy even though Jesus had showed those disciples on the road to Emmaus all of the prophecy about him in the Old Testament concerning his death and his suffering and his resurrection. And Thomas says, I will not listen to those prophecies unless I see him and touch him. I will not believe. Thomas is not willing to listen to eyewitness testimony. They're saying to him, we're telling you we've seen him with our own two eyes. Friends, oh, how man's stubborn heart keeps him from God. Our stubbornness keep, keeps us from God. 
And Thomas believed that his own tangible, physical, empirical evidence was the best proof of anything. And so we ask, what would become of doubting Thomas? Would he die in unbelief? Verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now verse 26 tells us that this took place eight days later, and that's actually a Greek idiom that is inclusive of the day that they're on. And so this was a Sunday that they had met on, and so this would be the following Sunday. And you say, well, that's only seven days, if you count from the Monday. But if you include the Sunday also, then you have eight days. So this is the next Sunday that they're together. And again, the subject of our story is Thomas. You see it there in verse 26. His disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Last time, Thomas wasn't there. This time, Thomas is there. That's the subject of our story. And listen, the story just repeats itself. So if you remember from last week, we won't go into a lot of detail because it's literally the exact same story. They're in their safe house. They're scared because the Jewish leaders had cooked up a story that they came and stole the body of Jesus in the middle of the night when the Roman guards were sleeping. They paid off the Roman guards so that the Roman guards would spread this story. And now the disciples were persona non grata and they were in hiding behind locked doors in the house even a week later. That's our setting. And so they're in the safe house. They're behind locked doors. Jesus comes through the walls and says, peace be with you. And John gives us a hint in verse 26 that maybe, maybe there's one guy in the room who still wants to have a look. Verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side do not disbelieve but believe wow Jesus is here for one guy Thomas and he obliges Thomas demand down to the specifics of Thomas demand Thomas specifically said finger in his hand and hand in his side. Jesus appears and says, come and do it. Amazing. Jesus called to Thomas says, do not disbelieve, but believe. And it was at this moment that Thomas realized this was for him. No one else could have known about his private conversation a week earlier behind locked doors telling his own colleagues, no, I will not believe unless. No one else could have passed through the locked doors. No one else would have those scars that he's staring at in Jesus' hand and side. And so a, a wave of emotion and realization and elation and, and, and joy and, and triumph and safety came rolling over Thomas' body. And he had only one response. And friends, this response is perhaps one of the greatest confessions in all of the Bible. Verse 28. Thomas answered him, My Lord, and my God. Don't let the moniker of doubting Thomas make you overlook this sweet, sweet moment. My Lord and my God. In the very first verse of the Gospel of John, John chapter 1 and verse 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And Thomas has just confessed this. 
Thomas expresses faith in the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, there are a lot of other statements uh, about Jesus in this gospel. For instance, in John chapter 1 and verse 34, you have John the Baptist who says that Jesus is the Son of God. That's John the Baptist's statement. And in, in John chapter 1 and verse 49, there's this disciple named Nathaniel who says that Jesus is the Son of God and the King of Israel. And that's a confession of itself. But then in John chapter 4 and verse 42, you have a group of Samaritans and they declare that Jesus is the savior of the world. And then in John chapter 9 and verses 33 through, through 38, you have the unblind man who had been healed. And he declares that Jesus is the son of man. And then in John chapter 11 and verse 27, you have Martha who declares that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. And then in John chapter 16 and verse 30, you have the disciples who declare that you came from God, Jesus. But friends, this one is different. John chapter 20 and verse 28 is different from all of those. This is possessive, mine. He's mine. My God. Now remember, Jesus had just said, and we looked at it about through four weeks ago, that my Father is your Father, and my God is your God. And in this moment of realization, Thomas remembers that, and he says, my God, my God. Thomas makes this fiercely personal. Perhaps it is the most poignant expression of Jesus' deity in the Gospels by one of Jesus' disciples. And remember John chapter 8 and verse 28 where Jesus prophesied that this confession would take place. Listen to what he said. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority but speak just as the Father taught me. Then you will know after I am lifted up that I am. But friends, as wonderful as this confession is, as much as we don't want this moment to pass us by, Jesus wasn't here merely for a reunion with Thomas. Verse 29. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus pours cold water right all over Thomas' confession. This is a gentle rebuke, if you hear it in Jesus' words. Have you believed because you've seen me, Thomas? In John 4, 48, Jesus, Jesus said, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe, rebuking those who would not believe his words. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 42, we read how Jesus rebukes those who look for a sign. And he says, those who never saw Jesus, Nineveh, but believed, will actually stand in judgment on those who saw Jesus, but didn't believe. And so Jesus is implying a rebuke here. It's like this. <laughs> Thomas, <laughs> you should have believed without having to see. Have you believed because you've seen me? Peter's in the room smirking. Told you so. Just imagining Thomas in this moment with the joy of seeing the risen Savior and the embarrassment and, sh and shame as Jesus says to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Does that seem a little unfair? Does it seem a little unfair of us to beat up on Thomas so much because you say, well, a week ago, if we, if we go back to the last passage, didn't the disciples get to see Jesus' hands inside. <laughs> so why is Thomas getting beaten up on? Because Thomas should have believed them. They expounded to him the Old Testament scripture. They were eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection, and Thomas should have believed them. 
And now we come to our big blessing. The blessing is on those who haven't seen. Now, verse 29 doesn't say you're more blessed than those who haven't seen. It simply says you're blessed. But there is an implied comparison here, meaning Jesus is comparing two groups of people. There's this group over here who has physically, empirically seen Jesus. And this group over here who has not. Two groups. And only one of them in this passage gets a blessing pronounced on them. The ones who haven't seen Jesus. In other words, if Thomas had believed a week earlier, he would have received this blessing. He would have gotten it. And so we go back to this word blessed now, which we brought up at the beginning of the sermon. What does it mean to be blessed? Because the person who hasn't seen gets a blessing. To be blessed means that God looks on you with favor. But it's not like he's just merely smiling at you. It means that he will give you some kind of favorable circumstance. Some kind of blessing. He is invoking favor upon you. John only uses the word blessed three times in his gospel. This word is used 50 times throughout the New Testament. Now usually or often when we see the word blessed in the Bible, we know what the blessing is. Okay, because I don't know if you noticed when you just read this, it doesn't actually say what the blessing is. It just says, blessed is the one who has not seen and yet believed. And we're, we're left wondering what is the blessing? Well, usually when we're going through blessings of God, he tells us what the blessing is. So the very first time in the Bible that this word is used is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 22. Inter interestingly enough, it's when God creates fish and birds in Genesis 1. And the Bible says that God blessed them. And you know what he said when he blessed them? Be fruitful and multiply. So he described to us what the blessing is. The blessing is multiplication, fruitfulness. In the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, God not only tells us that we are blessed, but he describes to us what the blessings are. And so, for example, blessed are the peacemakers. But he doesn't stop there. He describes what the blessing is. The peacemakers are blessed. How? They'll be called children of God. In James chapter 1 and verse 12, we read, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. How will that person be blessed? James tells us he will receive the crown of life. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 6, we read, blessed are the ones who take part in the first resurrection. Well, how are you blessed if you take part in the first resurrection? John tells us in Revelation 20 and verse 6, because on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And the very last use of the word blessed in the Bible is in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14, where we read, blessed are they that do his commandments. And how are they blessed who do his commandments? They have the right to the tree of life and can enter the gates of the city. But in our passage today, we don't have the answer. What is the blessing? How are we blessed? And so our big question is, in what way are we blessed by not seeing that we would not be blessed by seeing? Why is it that God says those who have not seen are blessed, whereas those who have seen don't get this blessing? Why would one be more blessed than the other? Well, I think there are several possibilities. First, friends, when our faith is made sight, when our faith is made sight, those of us who haven't seen, oh, I'm telling you, we're going to have more joy, more happiness, more relief than those who have already seen. If I were to ask you to name for me the top three hymn writers, of years gone by. Many of you might have someone in your head right now. You might think of Charles Wesley. 
But I bet somebody has in their head right now Fanny J. Crosby, who wrote over 8,000 hymns. Interesting thing about Fanny J. Crosby is she was born blind. And at one point in Fanny Crosby's life, there was a, a pastor, a minister, who was attempting to say something kind about all these wonderful hymns that Fanny Crosby had written. And he said this to Fanny Crosby, I think it is a great pity that the master, when he showered so many gifts upon you, did not give you sight. Fanny responded to this minister, do you know that if at birth I had been able to make one petition to my creator, that it would have been that I should be born blind? The minister, looking back at her dumbfounded, asked simply, why? To which Fanny replied, because when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. She then went on the, to write the song, My Savior, first of all. Let me read for you just a few of the words of this song before we continue to look at this text. When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side. And his smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know him. I shall know him, and listen to this, and redeemed by his side. I shall stand. I shall know him. I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. In one of her other verses, she says, through the gates, or rather, oh, the dear ones in glory, how they beckon me to come. And our parting at the river, I recall. To the sweet vales of Eden, they will sing my welcome home. But I long to meet my Savior, first of all. Oh, a woman who understands that even without sight, she is blessed. Why? Why is it that we have this blessing? Perhaps it is because we will have more joy, more happiness, having not seen him. But second, I wonder, perhaps it is because it requires greater faith. Does it not? It required greater faith of Thomas. Faith that he did not exercise. And thus we are not more happy in that we are blessed, but perhaps we are more highly commended by God. Do you remember the centurion in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 10? He wanted his child to be healed. And what did he say to Jesus? Oh, you don't need to go there. Just say the word and it will be done. Jesus looked at him and said, I have not seen greater faith in all of Israel. And so how are we more blessed? Perhaps it is simply that God looks upon those who have not seen and yet have believed and he more highly commends them. They are more highly rewarded. In other words, friends, I think Thomas lost something special here as much as it was wonderful to see the Savior. On Wednesday evening, those of you who were there, I asked you a question at the end. I said, would, would anyone just raise their hands very quickly, if you've seen Jesus and you've seen the nail prints in his hands and the spear print in his side. And I might even ask that this morning. If anyone has seen Jesus physically and, and seen the nail prints in his hands and seen the spear in his side, could you please raise your hand? And there are none. There are none. None of us. You know what that means, don't you? This blessing's for you. 
John's writing to a future group of believers that, that is the church. We won't see Jesus in this life. And if we believe, then friends, we get this special blessing, special favor. When we fall before God's sovereign authority, when we give up our own understanding, when we stop searching for empirical evidence, and when we simply say, I believe that Jesus is right, no matter what. This is why Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, because faith isn't sight. Faith doesn't require sight, but faith will be rewarded by sight. 2 Corinthians 5.7 says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. And friends, even though we don't have sight, do you think we love Jesus any less? No way. 1 Peter 1.8 says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, listen to this and tell me if this sounds like a person who has seen or hasn't seen. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. The person who hasn't seen him loves him like that. See what you can have without seeing. And you, you came in this morning and you said, but I don't feel blessed. I don't feel feel that you know why i have the answer for you because you're disbelieving that's it and i'll tell you something there's two ways to disbelieve the first is this you might be here this morning and you say i don't feel blessed perhaps because you have never believed you have never believed in jesus as master and Lord. You've never repented of your sin. You, you've, you've rejected Christ. Not that you've said the words, I hate him or I despise him, but you have never come and repented of your sin and called out to Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Maybe you're looking for some empirical evidence that will never show its face. You have it. You have the same prophecies unveiled before our eyes that the disciples had that Thomas had. You have the signs and wonders that are recorded here. You have the trees that you will see when you leave this building and the mountains. You have your own sinfulness and everything that this book tells you about yourself is true. You have marriage. You have morality. Everything the Bible says is proven true. And so if, if you're here this morning and you're saying, I've never believed like that. Like I've never had a moment in my life where I came to Jesus and said, I am sorry for my sin and I want to follow Jesus as my Savior and as my Lord. Then I would implore you, do it today and you will be blessed and highly favored. And if you'd like more information, help on that, where to go in the Bible, more questions, please come and see me and I would love to lead you to the Savior, lead you to this blessedness. But second, the second kind of disbelief, you say, I don't feel blessed this morning. Well, the second kind of disbelief is the disbelief that believers have. Aha. You know why you don't feel blessed? Because you stop believing the promises of God. You stop believing that you are blessed, that you will be rewarded. You don't actually believe that all of the promises of blessing are yours. I mean, if I told you, you're going to get a crown of life and you're going to have the right to enter that city. The right to enter that city. And you're going to have the right to the tree of life. You are going to inherit the earth. You are a son of God. How can that not make you feel blessed if you believe it? but we don't believe God. And listen, the songs we sing this morning, it's hard. How long, O oh Lord? I will wait for you. It's hard. I'm not beating up on you. I'm not beating up on Thomas. 
And not seeing is harder. It requires more faith. Look, it's easy to trust in a tank or a physical army, but it's hard to trust in an invisible host of angel armies. It's easy to trust in a bodyguard or a group of bodyguards, but it's hard to trust in an invisible God. And so God looks upon us that would believe without seeing as as blessed, as highly favored over those who saw. Thomas got to see. That's what convinced him. The intangible intruder in the flesh. But we don't get to see, friends, and we're blessed for it. But don't think we're better than Thomas, okay? The message is the same for us. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Be believing. Keep believing. That's why we need 2 Corinthians 4.18, which tells us we shouldn't focus on the temporal things, what we can see. But isn't that what we do? And we get fearful and we become angry. We become bitter. We become complacent. We become spiritually lackadaisical. We become spiritually ornery. Because we stop believing. And I want you to notice one last thing as you think about this text. That Jesus helps us in our weaknesses. Sometimes it's hard to believe. I get it. And that's why the story of Thomas is in the Bible. Because it's hard to believe. So that we don't make the same mistake. So as much as we beat up on Thomas, what did Jesus do? When Thomas said, I will not, I will never, never believe. What did Jesus do? Did Jesus say, Thomas doesn't believe? Well, then anathema on him. Let him suffer and die. Condemned. He came back for him. God gives grace in unbelief. And you say, why won't Jesus do that for me? Why won't he show up in my locked room when I'm going through all my hardest times? He did it for Thomas. Because he's written it down, friends. We know the story. We know what happened. So we don't get the same excuse. We have it all right here. The story of grace in unbelieving. And so I would say to you this morning, claim that blessing. Hold on to that blessing. How are you doing today? I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm blessed and highly favored because I believe without seeing And though I'm not entirely sure what form that blessing will take, what that blessing will look like, but boy, oh boy, it should keep us believing, shouldn't it? It should keep us trusting. It should keep us in the arms of the Savior when everything around us in our lives just seems so hard, so impossible. When doubts arise and fears assail, I will not disbelieve. I will never, never disbelieve. And so I leave you with this. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. So keep believing without seeing. You are blessed and highly favored. Let's pray. God, thank you for giving us this story. Because this is exactly what we all struggle with. And so we get to see that Thomas was the first one to go through it. We're just doubters. And the reason we don't feel blessed is because we don't believe you. And it's easy, easier to believe what we consider to be empirical evidence. Things that we can observe with our senses. That's what Thomas thought. Oh God, help us to say my Lord and my God when our own demands of empirical evidence are not met. May we trust you, even as we ask, how long, O Lord? Even as we say, why, my soul, are you downcast? May we also say, I will praise you, yet praise you again. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.